Greetings, folks. We're back for Chapter 17, Factories, Cities, and Families in the Industrial Age. Hope everyone's doing well with the course. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing your journals this week. So please, get ready for uh, a, a lively lecture, because we're talking about the evolution of the cities, as well as the Industrial Evolu uh, Revolution. Now, when we're talking about this, we're really looking at the period of 1780 to uh, essentially 1860, which encompasses what we call the first industrial revolution. We're going to be looking across this in terms of Western Europe, uh, England, France, Germany, which Germany's not yet there, so Prussia will be the country that we'll be looking at. We'll be looking at a little le lesser degree uh, to Russia as well. Now, when we're looking at the industrial revolution and industry spreading, we are really looking at a booming commercial economy in the West. And we're going to have to look at it in the sense of Western and non-Western worlds. Many of the countries that we've been examining so far, Britain, France, um, Belgium, the Netherlands, um, and others, have large territorial possessions in the New World and in Asia and Africa. And they're exploiting those for cheap materials which they bring to their uh, mother country, in this case England or France, to mill into finished products which they'll sell elsewhere to other countries and raise hard capital. And we know that these, these uh, economies, especially the English economy, is booming from com colonialism and this mercantile trade and they're raising all kinds of money and they're doing it in such a fashion that they can now begin to reinvest in other things. And we'll talk about how those other things shape up during the course of the lecture. Now, when we talk about Britain, we're really looking at a number of things that are helping it along in the Industrial Revolution. Number one, commercial vigor. They are the largest trading country in the world. As they have the largest merchant marine, which means they have the largest number of ships carrying products of all countries involved. Um, they have an enormous transportation network, especially internally in England. They have railroads, the largest penetration of railroads per capita of any country. They also have a number of raw materials. England is very blessed to have good supply of coal, some iron ore, um, and that helps them as well. But they also have great supplies overseas in their colonial power, uh, colonial areas, which they are, take back to their mother country power. Now, the other thing we're going to see is labor is going to be rather um, unique in England. We're going to see the development of the proletariat, which means that we're going to see a uh, number of people working in factories for low wages, happy to have jobs and regular paychecks, which will help spur on uh, English industry. And we're going to, when we're going to see in this phase is the development of the factory, a centralized workplace, oftentimes located in, cin in cities because that's what the greatest concentration of labor, um, manufacturing products for increasingly smaller amounts of money which will begin to pr um, expand capital production and, and sales. Now they also have capital which means that they have um, money to invest in infrastructure, new factories, new machinery, roads, canals, railroads, and that's going to be an important thing as well. The other thing we're going to be looking at is entrepreneurship. The English during this period are going to become some of the greatest traders and some of the greatest entrepreneurs, developing new products, new, new um, techniques, and new processes to help spur on the economy in various fields. We'll see this in transportation, steel, mining, and a number of different things, even agriculture. Now if we take a look at this, we're going to be looking at the expansion of the canal systems in England. And if you notice, the darker areas are huge areas of coal fields up here in Newcastle in northern England, Leeds and Sheffield in central England, also over in Wales. We're going to have iron, coal, and huge coal deposits. And these deposits are going to be um, combined to make iron ore and later on steel, which are going to be the back bone of the material used for this new second or first industrial revolution. But how do you get these products to market, especially at a time when roadways are very poor, 
Um, and remember that most of the product is being, is being taken to market by road is usually by horse carts. And these horse carts are going to be very confined in terms of the amount of product they can take. How do you get things to pro, uh, market better? So what we're going to see is the English are going to expand on their vast networks of river systems to build canals to hook river systems together in lot to allow products to go from east to west as well as from north to south to serve the larger cities where these factories are going to be located. Remember factories are going to locate in urban areas near waterways because they need energy. Remember electricity hasn't been founded yet so how are you going to power your machinery? Usually by water uh, power Water was pushing uh, turbine wheels and then pushing the machinery in the factory and providing the power for the factory. So that's going to be a, a big thing. Water hydro power is going to be a big element. And we're not talking hydroelectric power, just pure hydro power. Water pushing a wheel which turns a flywheel that makes a machine go type of thing. And you're only as good as the water flowing. But by expanding these canals and building new canals, England is going to be able to tie the sources of coal and iron together and bring them to the factories where they can be smelted in Birmingham, Manchester, and other places, Sheffield, which are huge iron producing areas. And they're going to be able to use those areas to build products that are going to be valuable to the English community. So 18th century Europe, which is essentially the 1700s, they're spending a significant amount of time on um, developing infrastructure, infrastructure that will lead to economic success. And we're going to see that's going to be primarily happening from the 1750s to the 1800s in England. And England is going to propel itself into one of the largest iron producing uh, countries in, in the world. The other thing we're going to see is a, a revolution in agriculture. We talked about the plow and the seed drill making agriculture uh, more important. We're going to also be seeing the devising of new devices to make um, efforts on the farm easier. One of the things you're going to start to see is the development of plows, iron tip plows, which will allow the pavement or the uh, the soil to be turned at a deeper rate, which means that products can be planted in a uniform, more uniform fashion. And what we're going to see is greater yields from the farms. More agriculture improves, more farms improve, more everything else works out. Now the other thing we're going to start seeing is the development of machines that will make the first industrial revolution primarily um, a revolution centering around the development of cotton and textiles as being the first products that will be impacted. Two of the things we're going to start to see, or actually three of the things, are going to be invented by entrepreneurs and inventors during this period. One is Richard Arkwright, who's going to devise something called the water frame, which is going to allow uh, water power to, uh, to power a uh, weaving loom, as well as a frame. We're going to see Edmund Cartwright develop the power loom, which is going to be a way to make thread into cloth in a better way. And then we're going to see an American, Eli Whitney, who's going to develop the cotton gin, which is going to take cotton um, plants take out the, the gin, which is the seeds, and make the cotton uh, more palatable to being shaped into cloth or thread. And that's going to help revolutionize this, this development. Remember that England at this time is getting the vast majority of its raw product from the United States. Remember, by this point in time, we are a free nation. We are also the largest pr producer of cotton in the world. So we're more than happy to sell England the cotton it needs for its uniforms and for other things. And we really do a good job of trying to promote that with the English at this period of time. The other thing we're going to start seeing is the improvements in spinning and weaving. Prior to this, spinning and weaving have been done at the household level, mostly cottage industries. This means that people, mainly women, bought their product from men who were roaming around and they would take that product and give it to them. They would in turn, turn the product, make uh, cloth, and sew up shirts or whatever and sell them back to the, the entrepreneur at a finished rate price. 
uh, which will allow them to uh, give them entrepreneurs enough supply so they can sell at retail. That's going to change with the development of these machines that are going to make cotton harvesting and looming and spinning much more efficient. So now what you're going to start to see is the development of factories which are going to put women inside of them so they can produce cloth in record numbers. And this begins in England first, and then is later translated out into the United States. We're going to find the development of these factories, and they seem to treat the women rather equitably and give people opportunities. Uh, but not necessarily here in England. It's going to be done in the United States. Now, the other thing we're going to see is the necessity for a true energy source. Prior to this, we've been using falling water and other natural sources for combining energy. Starting with the new transformation processes, coal is going to come into play. More coal is better. Remember that during this period of time, um, usually Britain and others have vast amounts of coal from their continents or their, their colonies, and they're able to use that coal as a uh, as a check to people's ambitions. Nobody's going to overrun them because they're going to be far too uh, hard to do that. Now coal is going to be great because once you burn coal, you produce heat. Heat is able to turn a turbine in terms of steam and you're able to get uh, propulsion. And propulsion is going to help with uh, staffing factories. Now the other thing we're going to see is the necessity to develop steel on a more concerted basis. And that's going to be done by um, promoting the steel business and using coal as a part of that steel production process. Now I always show this picture, students ask me who is the Continental Gin Company and most people think they're making alcohol spirits. No, gin refers to the cotton plant and the separation of seed from the actual fibers. What we're going to see in this picture is this huge complex. This is a gin factory. In other words, they're milling cotton to get the seeds out. It's going to be a huge enterprise. I point this out because all the factories at this time were huge enterprises with some exceptions. There were some places where there were um, efforts made to introduce um, components or elements and oftentimes those components and elements were introduced to people and they didn't make a lot of sense in terms of the uh, the product. This is what we're going to see here with the cotton gin company. It's not, it's, it's not alcohol, it's cotton. And what we're going to see is these large complexes with their own self-contained steam power. Now I'm notice I'm pointing to this building in the rear here. These were the, the uh, steam engine plants. In other words, one engine would be running the whole system in one place. And usually it was a huge boiler that was connected to this. So you'd have to have three or four times what the volume of a typical snowstorm, or a, a typical, um, not snowstorm, but a typical, um, a typical handful of, uh, of elements would be at this point in time. I'm going to take a little break now. I'm going to pause this up and 